Dr. Suga, shall we start now? Dr. Sugat. Okay, yeah. Shall we start? Yeah, shall we start? Uh, good afternoon, good evening to the veterinarian from the different region in the world. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, you are welcome to Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, second international webinar series. We have organized 16 webinars at the second. Uh, SLV International Ribbon Series. The first webinar we conduct this series. Today our topic is canine power viral diarrhea. Our research person, Professor Andrew Dikati Sarnayake from Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science. Uh, without wasting much time, I would like to invite Dr. Susan Malavarachi, the president, of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association to welcome you all. Dear President, how are you? Uh, very good evening. Uh, good afternoon to everyone from local and uh, Sri Lankan Veterinary Association and also Association and also from uh, Asian region veterinary doctors. Uh, you, Dr. Are Susan, you are muted. Sorry, did you hear me from the beginning or otherwise? Yes, from the beginning, yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, because uh, uh, today is very uh, important day because we know Sri Lanka Veterinary Association is conducting international session, and this is the first one. And uh, I really welcome everyone from uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association and also from overseas association, especially from Indian Veterinary Association. And uh, I'm happy that uh, we have been conducting sessions uh, during last year and also this year as the international sessions. And today we are talking about uh, canine power viral diarrhea and management, uh, diarrhea management and treatment. This is a very common subject and sometimes Doctors may think why we selected this subject. We know this, uh, though this is a, uh, I recall, a very common subject. It has been reported for many years uh, in the country, but still it is reporting. Though we have different treatment uh, protocols and vaccination protocols. So it, I think there is a point to discuss because uh, we have some uh, changes in our treatment protocols and management protocols. So we need to update our knowledge. So to talk about this subject today, we have invited Professor Anuradhika Disanayake from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science uh, from the University of Peradinia. And she is very uh, eminent speaker on this subject and also practically she has many experiences. And I welcome uh, uh, Professor Anuradhika also for this session and thank you very much for selecting a very good subject and uh, accepting our invitation to conduct this session. And there is a small uh, ground rule that is to keep your mic muted, not to disturb the audience. And uh, if there is any question, you can ask, uh, or otherwise you can send through chat box. And for further details, uh, I'll invite Dr. Chamari Kanangara, our secretary, SLVA to 
for con continue the session thank you thank you dr susanta malavarachi our president sri lanka veterinary association uh, to start today's webinar let me introduce uh, professor anuruddika first uh, professor anuruddika has been serving as an academic member of the faculty of veterinary medicine and animal science university of peradeniya for the past 14 years she initially joined department of pathology pathobiology in 2002 as a temporary lecturer and then continued as a lecturer and a senior lecturer at the same department she obtained her phd in veterinary microbiology and immunology in 2008 under commonwealth split site doctoral scholarship From 2011 to 2014 she worked at Children's Cancer Institute Australia as a research officer. During the same time she worked as a visiting academic fellow at School of Biotechnology and Biomolecular Science University of New South Wales Australia and continued her work on veterinary microbiology. After returning from Australia in 2015 she joined the Department of Veterinary Clinical Sciences and involved in teaching companion wild uh, and zoo animal medicine course with special focus on infectious and immune mediated diseases She has conducted research mainly on veterinary microbiology and immunology and has published over 20 original research papers She has done research on several disease conditions that affect companion animals and canine power virus is one of those. So uh, with that introduction let me uh, invite Professor Anuruddhika Disanayaka to continue today's webinar. Over to you Professor Anuruddhika. Uh, thank you Dr. Chamari. Um uh, good good afternoon. to all of you and um, thank you for inviting me to do this presentation uh, and uh, the topic given to me is canine power viral enteritis and uh, i was asked to focus mainly on the treatment and management aspect of the disease i thought to include a little bit about the vaccination because uh, this is a viral disease and there's no specific treatment so most basically the um, uh prevent the prevention is the method of control in this infection so i thought to include that as well so the first of all i thought to um, i hope that you all can see my screen can you see my screen yes uh, professor we can see right so i thought to um uh, include some important information about the characteristic of the virus because it will help us to understand the nature of the disease or nature of this disease so power the it's the, the latin meaning of power is the small power means small so it's a small non envelope single stranded dna virus and this is a recently emerged virus and it was emerged around 19 first detected around 1978 and um, it um, most uh, scholars suggested it's a host strain variant of the feline pan leukopenia virus so the, the this Uh, K9 power virus is more than 99% is sim similar to feline pan leukopenia virus so usually um, as you all know the rna viruses like influenza corona they have high mutation rate as a result of that it's hard to develop a vaccine against those diseases and usually the dna viruses they don't have a high uh, high uh, genetic substitution substitution rate but power virus is different to those uh, dna viruses other dna viruses and power virus has high genetic substitution rate so as a result of that within few decades of uh, uh, first emerge uh, now we have uh, three variants of the virus three known variants of the virus and there are so many uh, genetic variants these are called as antigenic variants because they are antigenically different so we have cpv2a 2b and 2c those strains are antigenically different in addition to that there are many genetic variants as well 
So the being a single stranded DNA virus, this virus doesn't contain DNA polymerase. So we all know to replicate, uh, it is essential to have DNA polymerase. And uh, therefore this virus used the, the DNA polymerase available in host tissue for its multiplication. So not all cells are rich in DNA polymerase, right? Only the, high, the cells with high turnover rate or high replication rate are rich in DNA polymerase. So that's why the power virus is affecting certain body sites like uh, intestine, sometimes uh, lymphoid organ, because the cells in those organs have high turnover rate, right? So the being a single-stranded DNA virus, it needs to have DNA polymerase. So the it's a virus selects the cells rich in DNA polymerase, uh, which are highly replicating cells. So as a result of that, intestine um, lymphoid organs are affected by the virus. And uh, we know it's a disease of a young disease of young animal. Usually, the young animal they have highly replicating cells when compared to adults. So that's why most often power virus is affecting young animals. Right. So so the. Maybe I hope that you all remember when we, when you are learning about the power virus, we, we used to learn about two forms, right? There's the cardiac form and intestinal form. Nowadays, we only see the cases of in, intestinal form or enteric form of the virus. Uh, the cardiac form, initially, um, it was uh, observed in many animals because uh, when young animals are affected or neonates are affected, their heart, muscles, heart cells are also replicating. But after six weeks of age, the, the turnover rate or replication rate of those cells are low. So if a neonate animal is uh, developed the disease as a result of in utero infection, that means if the neonate acquire the infection while it is in the uterus, they can develop cardiac form. Now this form is very rare because uh, uh, most of the uh, dams or beaches, they have uh, antibodies. So as a result of that, they won't develop the infection and then the fetus are protected from the infection as well. So the cardiac form is very rarely seen and some people say it's mostly associated with the original form of the virus, CPV2. Whereas the intestinal form, it can be caused by the original type, which is called CPV2 and the, the new variants, 2A, 2B, and 2C, right? So the most of the time, you know, we used to tell uh, it's the smell, the smell of the power virus. We, when we happen to see hemorrhagic diarrhea, we always think it's power. But there are cases which won't develop hemorrhagic diarrhea, right? Because uh, depending on the level of antibody teeters that the puppies have, they may develop mucoid to hemorrhagic diarrhea. They, sometimes they have antibody teeters and that level is not enough to protect them from the active infection. But uh, the severity of the disease could be reduced if they happen to have a certain level of antibodies. So depending on the, the level of uh, antibody teeters, animal may develop mucoid to hemorrhagic diarrhea. So, um, Usually the vaccine, uh, most of the vaccines contain the original strains like CPV2. And this vaccine uh, um, is uh, capable of protecting uh, dogs against all three variants, CPV2, A, B, and C. The it says it's possible, but later on, uh, some studies have shown it's not. We will discuss it later. Um, and in addition to that, there are cases of power viral enteritis among properly vaccinated dogs. And we will discuss the reason for those later. So um, I will just go through the clinical signs of uh, power viral infection very briefly. So it's uh, the most often, the first sign that we could see is the sudden onset of anorexia. And then animals show lethargy and depression those are non-specific clinical signs, but it's very commonly associated with power viral enteritis. And after that, you may see vomiting. Initially, sometimes some animals, they vomit for two to three days, or sometimes 
even longer than that without showing signs of diarrhea. And then uh, the vomiting is followed by diarrhea. So as I said, diarrhea could be mucoid or sometimes it could be hemorrhagic. And uh, young animal, usually the animal uh, six weeks to six months of age, they are more susceptible to power viral enteritis. The puppies who are in the age range of, uh, you know, day zero to six weeks of age, they are usually protected by maternal derived antibodies, right? The mothers, they pass the antibodies to the offspring through the colostrum. And as a result of that, puppies are protected from the infection, maybe up to six weeks or sometime even longer than that. So um, usually the between six to six months of age, the dogs are susceptible to uh, power viral enteritis. Um, so, uh, uh, as I said, susceptibility increase when the maternal antibodies start to decline or reduce, and then they are more and more susceptible to infection. So, um, usually when they ingest the virus, it's orofecal route, right? They uh, ingest the virus and then uh, our first day, uh, second day, the replication of the virus occurs in the oropharyngeal uh, lymph node. Right, and then it uh, spread to the bone marrow, and then uh, go to the intestine via blood. Within uh, two to three days, it could happen. Right, so usually on third day, the animal will, will develop marked viremia. That means the virus is present in the blood. They develop viremia, and on day four, they may be uh, they will develop the signs of intestinal disease. Right. Sometimes it may take longer than that, even after six, seven days uh, of uh, ingestion, they will develop uh, diarrhea. And uh, usually around day seven, amount of uh, virus uh, uh, present in the uh, feces is usually reduced, but it's not the case all the time. And it may last even two to three weeks. And usually after 10 days of the infection, uh, puppies, they recover from the power viral infection. And um, usually after two weeks uh, of exposure, there won't be virus present in the uh, feces. So as I said, the multiplication of the virus, it occurs in highly replicating cells. So highly replicating cells are present in the lymphoid organs, sometimes lungs, liver, kidneys, right? And most often in the bone marrow and GIT epithelia. So it's a sort of multisystemic disease because there are high number of uh, replicating cells in the bone marrow and GIT epithelium. We see clinical signs related to those sites. Right? And uh, cardiac myocytes, as I said, it's usually affecting neonates, not uh, old animals. And uh, the virus is shed in feces within four to five days of exposure and then throughout the period of illness and uh, usually 10 days after clinical signs uh, decline, then there won't be virus in the uh, feces. And, uh, you, it's a sort of small intestinal diarrhea, but only certain segments of the intestine is affected by the virus, right? Usually the duodenum and jejunum uh, is affected by this virus. And it is, uh, we can see the segmental uh, uh, sort of necrosis uh, due to power viral enteritis. Only uh, I'll show you a photograph. Um, so the, usually the, the, cells present in the crypt of the intestinal epithelium has the highest rate of uh, replication. So those cells are most commonly affected and lymphoid, lymphoid tissues such as spleen, bone marrow, thymus, uh, uh, lymph nodes, uh, those uh, are affected. Uh, when the intestinal crypt epithelium uh, uh, necros or destructed, 
villous atrophy can occur. So as a result of that, absorption is impaired. And then uh, when the, the, the epithelium barrier is uh, destructed, there's a, uh, you know, the gut barrier which prevent bacteria entering into the circulation. It is also destructed. So as a result of that, bacteria will translocate from GI tract to bloodstream, causing bacteria. And most often, the animals affected with power virus, they die due to hypovolemic shock uh, caused by severe vomiting and diarrhea or due to translocation of bacteria causing uh, septicemia, right? So the septicemia and hypovolemia are the main reason for the death uh, caused by power virus. Um, so as I mentioned this several times, extent of the, or the severity of diarrhea is depend on the antibody titer. So we used to go by, you know, if we happen to see hemorrhagic diarrhea, we always say it's powerful, but we need to understand that there are cases with mucoid or small, um, you know, the certain amount of water in diarrhea, which could be caused by power wire. So, so it depends on the antibody detail. So this is the picture I mentioned. You can see the segmental pattern of the hemorrhages uh, in the intestine. Sometimes the whole um, epithelium as well as the underneath layer will be stuck off and only the outer covering, outer mucosal layer uh, will be retained in certain puppies. In severe cases, right? Uh, you might have seen the whole, uh, the, the mucosal layers are excreted out. So, so these are the, the lesions that you could see in mild cases, right? You can see the uh, my hemorrhages affecting the, the face patches. You know, there are methods to diagnose power viral enteritis. Usually the PCR is available. I think the most important thing is whatever the reason, hemorrhagic diarrhea are managed and treated in the same way, right? The most important thing is uh, we have to manage the leukopenia. I said, uh, I already mentioned the bone marrow uh, and the progenitor cells, uh, they are affected. And as a result of that, animal will develop severe leukopenia. So you may see sometimes moderate to severe leukopenia and the leukopenia could be seen in the first uh, three days of uh, infection. And after that, there may be leukocytosis due to uh, septicemia. If animal happen to develop septicemia, then we see leukocytosis. So the normal picture is in first three days, you may see leukopenia and after that, there may be leukocytosis. So usually this leukopenia is due to lymphopenia and neutropenia. Neutropen the leukopenia and lymphopenia uh, and uh, absence of bad neutrophils in uh, blood smear after 24 hours uh, of uh, starting treatment has a you know, poor prognosis. Because when we happen to see um, um, more neutrophils in the blood and when there are lymphocytes as well, then we know that the body is reacting. And when there are banned neutrophils, we know that the body is uh, reacting, body is responding to demand. So if those cells are absent in blood, me blood smear, then uh, it says the, uh, the prognosis is poor. Um, usually the lymphopenia and neutropenia develop uh, due to destruction of hematopoietic cells in the uh, bone marrow and sometimes thymus as well as in the lymph node. When these cells are disrupted by the replicating virus, severe lymphopenia and neutropenia can occur. In addition to that, neutropenia can occur due to the migration of neutrophil into the site of infection, right? When there's a severe inflammation occurring in the small intestine, neutrophils present in the circulation can migrate to that site. And as a result of that, we see severe neutropenia in the peripheral circulation. So what I'm trying to say is rather than uh, trying to confirm it as power, it is important to see the, uh, the blood picture because blood picture will help us to understand the outcome of the disease. 
we can predict the prognosis of the disease based on the um, blood results. And if we happen to see total WBC count is lower than 2000, that means it is uh, important because the animal with uh, WBC count lower than that level are having poor prognosis. For those animals, we have to uh, do, uh, we have to, uh, you know, attend different uh, treatment. And then uh, other, other than that, uh, I think one slide is not deleted or something. Anyway, what I wanted to tell is uh, it is important and there are, we can use PCR to diagnose. In addition to that, there are uh, clinic side or patient side rapid uh, antigen detection kits. Those are also reliable, but the thing is uh, those uh, antigen detection kits will not work in the first few days of the disease. It will take, uh, the, there should be enough uh, viral dose or antigen uh, present in the species to be detected by those kits, right? So PCR is reliable. Uh, patient side uh, kits are also very sensitive and reliable, but the thing is very specific and reliable. But if the viral lo load is low, uh, you will get false negative results. And sometimes when the animals are vaccinated with live attenuated virus uh, vaccine, then uh, they can shed the virus in the feces for maybe uh, for 10 days after vaccination. So as a result of that, you may see false positive uh, response to these uh, kids as well. So you have to keep those minds if you are using those. What, I'm to try, what I'm, I want to tell you is the most important thing is to uh, check the uh, blood hematological parameters than confirming the infection. So we'll uh, now move to the, the treatment aspect of this disease. As we all know, fluid therapy is the, the most important uh, uh, thing, important thing in managing power viral enteritis. When we are uh, giving fluid, it is always important to remember that we have to give both lactated wrinkles and normal saline. And usually for dehydrated animals, it is recommended to give lactated wrinkles. And uh, if the animal is severely dehydrated, we can give bolus, fluid bolus. It is called fluid bolus. I'm sure that you are familiar with that. So in animal, in, and even for septicemic patient, if they develop septicemia secondary to power viral enteritis, then it is recommended to give fluid bolus. So when you are giving fluid bolus, we give like 60 ml to 90 milliliters. 60 to 90 milliliters we can give. With, uh, four kilogram body weight within 15 minutes. Usually, you know, small, uh, maybe four, 10 kilogram uh, dog, you can give one bottle of saline within 15 minutes as bolus to uh, uh, restore the hydration. Usually, the you know, in practical situation, you do not need to give that much. When you are giving certain volume, animals will show that the, he is for oh, it's uh, rehydrated, then we can stop giving. But initially, it is recommended to give bolus. What you're supposed to do is you take uh, um, saline into a syringe using a three way tap, it's the best way. And if you don't have three way tap, still you can um, take saline into a um, syringe and then you can give it uh, like we are giving intravenous injections to uh, uh, dogs, right? So, like that, we can give fluid bolus. And usually, um, you know, when they are dehydrated, it de are hydrated, it is very difficult to uh, locate the veins. It is difficult to give IV fluid, and we usually tend to give subcut fluid to those patients. But it is not recommended to give subcut fluid to uh, severely dehydrated patients. Any, can you hear me or any problem? No, Professor Anurudhika, we can hear you. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, giving subcut fluid is not recommended for dehydrated dose. And, uh, and then in addition to fluid, we have to give energy. And sometimes I have seen people are using 5 or 10% dexport glucose uh, to give energy, and it is not recommended. Uh, because when you are giving this diluted uh, 
glucose uh, glucose uh, solution it doesn't contain any electrolyte it is important to restore the electrolytes as well because animal is losing lot of uh, chloride hydrogen ions through vomiting and bicarbonate ions through uh, diarrhea so it is important to restore the electrolytes so um, if we give more volume of uh, 5 to 10% glucose the volume that we can give using the lactator ringers or normal saline is uh, low so as a, as so it is recommended to uh, restore the energy using 25% or 50% dextrose right not using um, 5% or 10% glucose and then in addition to that we have to give amino acids as well right so fluid and energy we have to give and then uh, usually um, you know if the animal is showing only mild mucoid or watery diarrhea there's no need of giving antibiotic right but uh, if animal is showing signs of uh, hemorrhagic diarrhea then we have to give antibiotic because there's a risk of uh, translocation of bacteria from uh, gut to uh, circulation to prevent uh, septicemia we have to give antibiotic right most of the time i have seen people are using like cefuroxime ceftriaxone uh, those uh, you know cephalosporins um so the cephalosporins has a side effect of uh, inducing diarrhea and vomiting as well so in addition to that most of the bacteria which is translocating through the gut epithelium is e coli and uh, this e coli uh, you know variant which is highly distributed uh, or highly disseminated in sri lanka which is resistant to uh, uh, third and fourth generation cephalosporin as well as to quinolones at the same time that means those strains are resistant to uh, you know cefriax most of the third and th third and fourth uh, cephalos generation cephalosporin and uh, ciprofloxacin and enfloxacin so my you know choice is uh, clavulinated amoxicillin because those the, that particular even the extended spectrum beta lactamase producing e coli which could translocate through the gut and which could cause septicemia can be uh, prevented by giving clavulinated demoxicillin right clavulinated demoxicillin is not inhibited by those organism and then uh, when we are giving uh, and after usually after 3 days or 4 days of onset of uh, bloody diarrhea um, it is good to do complete blood analysis right if there are bad neutrophils and if you see severe leukocytosis which is suggestive of septicemia then we can increase the dose rate rather than changing the antibiotic the first thing that we should do is change the dose rate right you know the usually antibiotics when you are prescribing is given as a range you should, uh, if i take uh, menthine or clavulinated amoxicillin as an example the dose range is i think 11 to 25 mg per kg so initially we can start with 12.5 mg per kg uh, and we can give it in 12 hour interval and then after 3 days you check the blood uh, sample and if you see a lot of bad neutrophils and severe leukocytosis then we can increase the dose rate of uh, uh, augmentin or clavulinated amoxicillin to Uh, 22.5 mg per kg or even up to 25 mg per kg and then instead of giving two weeks uh, uh, 12 hour interval we can increase the uh, we can decrease the interval right we can increase the frequency that means we can give it eight hours three times daily right so before changing the antibiotics it's better to increase the dose rate and interval because uh, antibiotic resistance is a huge problem so if we frequent, frequently uh, change the antibiotic it will result in causing antimicrobial resistance so um, if you do this way it will you know to a certain extent will help to overcome that that problem and even after changing the antibiotic if you happen to see septicemia persists then we can change the antibiotic to metronidazole in uh, you know up to 
I think last month, even I was used to tell to combine amoxicillin or clavulinated amoxicillin with metronidazole. But it's no longer recommended. WHO has, uh, recom has stated that it is not recommended to use combination of metronidazole or ampicillin in clinical practice. So I think better to uh, stop dog maintain and start metronidazole intravenously if you happen to see um, signs of septicemia. And then we have to select an antiemetic, right? Um, in our days, when we were student, we always gave promethazine and metoclopramide. It is not recommended because you know the certain segment of the intestine is extremely weak due to this. Uh, Disease. The, the whole mucosa, mucosa layers are suffocated, and only the outer covering is remaining. When we give metoclopramide and promethazine, it will increase the gastric emptying and it will increase the peristaltic movement. And as a result of that, the rotation uh, can occur, volvulus, like the intestine can rotate uh, and cause uh, obstruction. So it is not recommended to give metoclopramide though. Uh, promethazine due to that reason, uh, recommended to give ondansetron or meropetan, but meropetan is not available in Sri Lanka. I think it's not registered. So ondansetron uh, is the recommended antiemetic. And uh, it is important to give vitamin B, right? Because uh, we are giving antibiotics. So as a result of that, the, the bacteria producing thiamine in the intestine are also uh, killed or destroyed. And in addition to that, vitamin B12, cyanocobalamin, it has a, um, what do you call, hepatobiliary circulation, right? It is usually secreted um, through the bile duct into the duodenum. When the duodenum and jejunum is affected by the virus, those uh, vitamin is not uh, properly reabsorbed. So it is recommended to give IV injections of vitamin B to uh, puppies or dogs with power viral enteritis. And then when, we, when you do the blood analysis, and if you happen to see WBC count lower than 2000 uh, per deciliter, it is important to attend that. We have to attend that because otherwise uh, the animal with the low WBC count, they have poor prognosis. So in such instances, it is recommended to give colonic stimulating factor, or we can do a, uh, it's expensive. So, uh, even can do a blood transfusion. And then if you are giving, doing a blood transfusion, it is good to take blood or uh, even um, whole blood. Uh, we can collect it from a uh, vaccinated dog. So in addition of providing the WBC and other cells, it will help to uh, transfer certain amount of antibodies as well, which will help the uh, dog to overcome the disease. Right. So as I said, I included uh, certain uh, information about the vaccines and vaccination. And uh, I, I'm sure that you all are familiar with the available vaccines in Sri Lanka. I have seen killed vaccines as well. Both killed and live attenuated CP vaccines are available. Right In the world, it's available. Sri Lanka also, I have seen a couple of uh, killed vaccines as well. However, these uh, killed vaccines are not very effective in overcoming maternal antibodies. So as a result of that, the killed vaccine are not recommended to, uh, um, you know, recommended in primary vaccination schedule. That means we are not supposed to use killed vaccines to immunize puppies because it could be neutralized by maternal antibodies. And in addition to that, the killed vaccines contain the adjuvant. And usually the vaccine, the allergies, or hypersensitivity reactions that occur due to vaccines are caused by those adjuvants. So the killed vaccine will develop, uh, more likely to develop uh, vaccine-associated hypersensitivities. And in addition to that, these killed vaccines are not recommended to include, include in routine vaccination schedule. You can use it only for pregnant bitches or exotic pets. Right? For wild animals, we are not supposed to give live attenuated vaccine because you know the, these vaccines are tested to use in dogs. 
and if we give it to uh, some other host species the mutations can occur and uh, there may be new variants can emerge as uh, pau emerged from feline pan leukopenia certain new variants could uh, you know emerge as a result of the mutation that could possibly occur so um kill vaccines you have to remember it's not recommended to uh, use in routine vaccination of dogs and we have modified live attenuated vaccine right even the modified live attenuated vaccine uh, the vaccines available in sri lanka has a you know the vast range they are vary from each other they may vary uh, with the strain sometimes certain vaccines contain cpv2 some are containing cpv2a and some contain cpv2b and when you are purchasing a vaccine it is uh, uh, good to uh, see the viral strain present in the vaccine and then uh, you have to also check the viral dose and number of passages right uh, the uh, not at the sorry about that so the i think did some reason it i can put it on the full screen so dose of the the vaccine the dose of the virus present in the vaccine may vary from uh, 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 6 right when puppies are vaccinated using a uh, high teta vaccine that's mean the vaccine containing more than 10 to the power 6 viral dose it will help them to overcome the effect of maternal antibodies right so you have to check the viral dose present in the vaccine because particularly in the primary vaccination schedule it is good to use the vaccine with high viral dose and when high teta vaccines are used uh, you know the usually when we give the vaccine if the maternal derived antibodies are available it will bind with the antigen present in the vaccine and neutralize the antigen so if our vaccine contain more viral dose then certain amount of viral will remain even after neutralization uh, by maternal antibody certain amount will remain and that amount will may be enough to induce good immune response and in addition to that there are high teta vaccines as well right uh, low passage so, sorry low passage vaccines as well so low passage vaccines are also good because those vaccines can induce uh, and immunity which is almost equal to natural infection right the the low passage vaccines can induce very high immune response which is almost equal to natural infection because the virulent potency of this uh, virus is very high so they induce good immune response so when you are selecting vaccine please check the viral uh, strain present in the vaccine viral dose and the number of passages so at least whether it is high passage or low passage vaccine right i will uh, briefly go through the vaccination guidelines given by the uh, world uh, veterinary small animal association right the vaccine these are only guidelines uh, right these are not a set of rules so it is just tell you uh, the certain uh, guide give you certain guidance when you are vaccinating animals so in this guideline it's always recommended to use modified live attenuated uh, pau vaccine with high viral dose in primary vaccination usually it states it's good to start primary vaccination at the age of 6 to 8 weeks right 6 to 8 weeks because by that time the maternal and we assume that the maternal derived antibodies will decline uh, to a low level with it couldn't be interfere with the vaccine vaccine however you know it's not always the case and we do not check the maternal antibody level so as a result of that it is recommend to repeat this vaccination right repeat the vaccination in 2 to 4 weeks interval it's up to you to decide whether you want to give it in 2 weeks interval or whether you want to give it in 4 weeks interval right this is not a booster vaccine you have to remember that this is not a booster vaccine it is just a repeat vaccination to ensure that the maternal the interference caused by maternal antibody is overcome and sometimes you know the 
uh, dogs are they are not very good immune responders when they are very young. So we have to give certain time to mature their immune immune system. So there may be some other disease condition affecting dogs as well when they are young. So the as a result of that immune response induced by those uh, uh, puppies are low. So in due to that, we just repeat the vaccination until 14 weeks of life. When they are 14 weeks of age, the maternal derived antibody levels are no longer exist. And uh, in addition to that, their immune system is properly developed. Right? So we well, the important thing is start the vaccination between six to eight weeks of age. We usually start at eight weeks of age. Right? If you if you decide to do it at six weeks of age, it's okay. I, no one can say it's wrong. Both, you know, you can select it based on your experience. You can select whether to vaccinate at six weeks or eight weeks of age. But you have to repeat the vaccination and, uh, in two to four weeks interval until the animal is 16 weeks of age. And, you know, there are um, test kits available to detect the maternally derived antibody level. In other countries, they use those things, but the thing is, it's a bit expensive. It's expensive than several doses of vaccine. So I think practically it's um, not possible to use in our country. But if you happen to, if you happen to check the antibody theaters and confirm there are no maternal antibodies, and if you give a vaccine, and then after one month you have uh, seen a good immune response then there's no need to repeat the vaccination, right? Even for six weeks old uh, dog, puppy, you check, no maternal antibodies, you give vaccine, and then after one month, you check, and then there are very good uh, teeth of vaccine, then no need to repeat the vaccine at all, right? You can stop vaccination because single dose of modified live virus vaccine is enough to produce good immune response. We repeat the vaccination because there are so many ifs. Like maybe if maternal antibody is present, if animal's immune system is not responding, and if it's having any other disease condition like that. So if you are, anyway, other important thing that you need to remember is when we are giving too many vaccines, it also not good, right? It can cause IMHA and it can cause renal failure due to glomerulonephritis, you know, the antigen antibody complexes. Uh, deposit on the renal glomeruli and cause renal failure. And there may be other side effects as well. So it is not good to give too many vaccines. So um, that's why we usually use a four weeks interval. We start vaccination at eight weeks and then uh, give the second dose at 12 and the third dose at 16. And the other thing is our clients, they can't afford too many vaccines. And uh, thinking of all the aspects, we designed this protocol, but you can design yours based on the guidelines. No one can say, you know, our protocol is better than my, yours because we all do it blindly. We do not know the level of maternal antibodies. We do not need know the immune response of the puppies. So depending on the risk, even two weeks interval can be used, but you have to remember repeating is not that good. You have to do it wisely. So if a dog older than six weeks is presented to you for vaccination, just giving single dose of modified, modified live viral vaccine is enough. No need to give a second dose until um, one year of age, right? Sometimes, you know, if you want, you can repeat the vaccination at 26 weeks of age. That's mean half year. Or if you want, you can do it at one year of age. If you happen to do it at 26 weeks of age, no need to repeat it at 52 weeks, right? So this is just, uh, you know, the um, if there's any failure of developing uh, immune response during primary vaccination, and then it's not good to keep that uh, dog in a status of unvaccinated for one year. So Wasawa recommend to give, um, um, uh, you know, boost va booster vaccine, that is a booster vaccine at the 26 weeks of age or at 52 weeks of age. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, sometimes the, the vets ask, even it's a question, most of the time client uh, will ask you, 
if a, one puppy in a litter develop power viral enteritis while they are just undergoing vaccination it is okay to vaccinate other puppies and it is not recommended right usually if there's an infection going on and other puppies are in close contact with the pup, that particular puppy then it is not recommended to do vaccination because the incubation period of the power virus is very short like you know 2 to 3 days and then it will take 2 weeks to develop antibodies so it is not recommended but other diseases like you know distemper you can you can do vaccination because uh, it takes uh, only 5 days to develop immune response and it takes more than 2 uh, weeks to develop the disease right so you can uh, vaccinate puppies for distemper uh, but not for how if an infection is going on and then uh, we all know that we used to do annual vaccination for adult dogs right we used to vaccinate animal every year but according to new guidelines that annual vaccination is not necessary especially pow you know it's a dog of a young dog uh, and adult dogs are at low risk and anyway usually when we use modified live viral vaccine uh, usually the immunity can last even up to 9 years according to the re- research publication sometime it may last up to 9 years sometime even up to 12 years or so life long so no no need to do repeated vaccination annually and you can do uh, you can give the vaccine every 3 and then i will quickly tell you and you know the most of the time client and even the vets get frustrated when they when we happen to see when a vaccinated dog develop how right so uh, we will i will briefly explain if a puppy is develop how viral enteritis within 2 weeks of vaccination right it could be due to that the dog had been infected with the virus by the time of vaccination or may be uh, exposed to the virus before developing the immune response maybe you know just after vaccinating puppy you have to advise owner to keep that puppy in the house in you know close premises at least for 2 weeks before because after vaccination the puppies are more susceptible to develop power viral enteritis uh, because maternal derived antibodies levels are low and then it takes two we it takes two weeks to develop immune response so this period puppies are particularly susceptible to power virus we called it as window of susceptibility so it is actually not a vaccination failure it is a natural phenomena uh, so you you have to advise the owners to care, keep the dogs in very close you know uh, to limit um, all sort of movements to prevent or to get exposure to the virus uh, two weeks of within two week period of vaccination particularly you know most of the time i have seen the you know we have very limited facilities and we use same table to uh, vaccinate puppies and uh, you know treat the cases so for viral diarrhea so it's possible to um, the puppies to acquire the infection from our clinic right this is very hard virus it won't be destroyed by normal household chemicals and you have to use a uh, uh, what do you call the uh, chlorine to um, destroy this virus till the virus can persist so you have to be very careful and if you have a separate place to vaccinate the puppies it is it would be the idea right so um, sometimes the the development of power viral disease could be due to vaccination failure certain vaccines uh, are unable to mount or uh, induce good immune response um, so the vaccination failure could be due to vaccine as well and sometimes it could be due to a poor poor immune response of puppy and significant proportion of puppies particularly rottweilers and uh, uh, you know Uh, particularly rottweilers they are unable to uh, get zero converted because they have a con- inherent problem of developing immune response they have some problems with their immune system so they are unable to get zero converted or develop a uh, good immune response and some as i mentioned it could be due to low immunogenicity of the vaccine 
so it is always advisable to buy a vaccine from a reliable manufacturer there are three leading vaccine manufacturers in the world so it's good to buy vaccine from one of those manufacturers at least for primary vaccination right booster vaccination you can use even low dose vaccine uh, low, uh, any other sort of vaccine but when you are using vaccines for primary vaccination good to use uh, uh, high dose vaccine from a reliable supplier and it may be due to um, you know inability to maintain cold chain it is important we you know there are all the time there are uh, power cuts electricity failures in our country and we do not have generators so as a result of that uh, we are in a huge risk of uh, you know inability to maintain cold chain so it can cause uh, vaccination failure and then uh, inappropriate administration particularly you know when you are vaccinated we use a, a cotton wool so with generous amount of alcohol and then we disinfect the site and then we just after that we administer the vaccine you know alcohol can kill the virus so the vaccine contain the virus and a certain amount of virus could be killed by the uh, alcohol so when you use cotton uh, so cotton soak with alcohol to disinfect the site just wait 2 to 3 minutes to uh, let it evaporate and then uh, when you are withdrawing the syringe do not use uh, cotton wool soak with alcohol because it can uh, you know penetrate the skin and can kill the virus so uh, okay that's all i go to tell uh, thank you very much for listening uh, thank you uh, uh, much uh, professor uh, it's a nice presentation uh, i have one quick uh, questions as uh, you said uh, when uh, one public get of how viral diarrhea uh, to the uh, rest of the litter uh, most of the time we uh, up to now we, we advise uh, to drink them separately the vaccination and keep uh, separately from the other dog sometimes they will survive after vaccination So, yeah, the thing so is, uh, you know, if they are in very close contact with each other, when one puppy is developing the diarrhea, that means others also have acquired the virus, right? They are incubating the virus, and yeah, it's advisable to separate them, uh, isolate the infected one, but you have to observe the other one whether they are developing the disease, right? Whether they are developing the enteritis, and uh, as there's a chance. high chance of uh, them developing the disease we are not uh, supposed to uh, give the vaccination because we are introducing more antigen into the body which is uh, also not good and then we won't be able to develop good immune response before developing the immunogenicity by the vaccine so before developing the disease that's why it's not recommended so yeah, yeah as you said you have to uh, you know separate uh, and them and observe them but wait a couple of uh, maybe uh, five days and see whether they develop uh, dis the disease right and if they do not develop the disease then you can give the vaccine is it uh, yeah is it it's clear thank you yeah, yeah. for december uh, as i said you can uh, you know even one puppy in puppy your dog in the same premises develop this temper you can vaccinate the others but not so far okay and and also you said uh, can you go to the uh, three or four uh, at the, at the beginning of the slide please this one yes that one no uh, the you said um no uh, other one pathogenesis or the no no uh, next one i think seven to eight one ah uh, seven, 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 seven to eight okay right seven please yeah is this um, this one ah uh, oh this one no i uh, you, uh, you said uh, after developing the signs 
ുക്കോപീനിയ <laughs> <laughs> no need to wait to treat you can uh, you know immediately start initiate treatment after seeing the diarrhea and vomiting but uh, it will take 3 uh, days to develop viremia that yeah. means the virus only present in the blood uh, after 3 days 3 days so if you yeah if you want to do a pcr right if you want to take blood and some labs they use blood sample so only after third day you can uh, collect blood because there are no viremia before that okay thank you dr okay dr tamari yeah, yeah dr suga can you hear me yeah, yeah. yeah uh, doc professor anrudhika there are a few questions in the chat box uh, i will uh, read the questions to you the first one is what is the earliest age in which power vaccine can be administered to puppies yeah, i think actually as i said it may be 6 to 8 weeks of age uh, it yeah that's the best uh, time but uh, as i said if you are sure that there are no maternal antibodies uh, you can vaccinate the puppies even earlier than that the problem is uh, you know we do not know whether the maternal antibodies are present or not that's why we wait but you know the most of these uh, low passage vaccine they sometimes recommend to give those vac- those uh, even at 4 um, weeks of age due to the reason i mentioned because uh, they have very high uh, Uh, you know the it's almost equal to the uh, the natural virus so they it will induce good immune response even in the presence of maternal derived antibodies but wasawa and their vaccination group guideline uh, is recommend to vaccinate the puppies at the age of 6 to 8 weeks not earlier than that even the vaccine says uh, you can use it at 4 weeks 4 week of age i think better to wait uh, till 6 3 okay thank you the next question is is there any possibility to develop high fever around 107 and sudden death in pow viral enteritis yeah the thing is pow virus itself won't cause fever right it won't cause severe fever it's just due to inflammation there may be but you know the the high fever is usually due to septicemia as i said they develop uh, the if the bacteria translocate through the the damaged gut epithelium and in, induce uh, septicemia then it's possible to develop 107 temperature and die suddenly yes okay thank you dr uh, the next one is uh, uh, why thanking you uh, the question is wondering about scientific explanation for not recommending ampicillin amoxicillin and metronidazole combination metronidazole combination yeah yeah the thing is uh, those are it is no longer recommended to combine two broad spectrum antibiotics not only the metronidazole ampicillin uh, is not recommended to combine doxycycline metronidazole uh, ampicillin cloxacillin these are two broad spectrum antibiotics when we combine two broad spectrum antibiotics in fixed dose rate there's a high chance of developing antimicrobial resistance because these drugs are having two different mechanism right one is acting protein synthesis other one is on the cell wall and when we combine those there may be high chances of developing um, uh, you know bacteria get mutated then developing antimicrobial resistance that's why not only that and i only mention uh, metronidazole and ampicillin here because it's relevant to uh, uh, this particular topic but it's not recommended to combine any sort of uh, two broad anti microbial drugs now okay uh, the next one is to my knowledge mostly only two vaccines are given initially for power in uh, for pups in sri lanka 
but according to your explanation it seems we need to vaccinate more than two times if we starts at six weeks is that correct yeah yes it, that's correct because if you start the vaccination earlier the number of doses that you need to give is high definitely because uh, the important thing is you have to ensure that you give the last dose of vaccine at the age of 16 weeks and we, as i said if you start the vaccination at 6 weeks of age if animal uh, the if the vaccine got neutralized by the maternal antibodies then the animal is not protected at all and they can develop the, the disease in between 6 weeks to 16 weeks of age so you give another dose uh, after maybe 2 or 4 weeks later and then uh, you know uh, this just to increase the chance of uh, developing the immune response so it's true that if you initiated the vaccine at the 6 weeks of age you may need to give more doses you know yeah some okay thank some you place. dr uh, professor anrudhika i i have one question uh, regarding mm -hmm. the diet uh, when the uh, uh, animal is fitted with power uh, is there any restriction of diet or any special diet which we have to give so any uh, sort of the, yeah the thing is you know we can't give uh, anything if animal is having a severe vomiting whenever animal uh, stop vomiting right sees vomiting is ceased we can introduce liquid there's no no longer it's recommended to do the the gut rest or uh, nop none uh, not giving any oral uh, food is no longer recommended if animal is not uh, having uh, if there's no vomiting then you can introduce maybe small quantities of uh, liquid diet very frequently right we can't give heavy meal because certain section of the intestine is severely affected and then when the when you know the when the the diet or the meal goes there it extended and that extension can cause induced vomiting so very small quantities at a time uh, can be given particularly liquid diet can be given milk or other you know soup or sort of thing even cereal or one other kanji like those things could be given heavy meals are not recommended high uh, you know lipid diets are not recommended and uh, but you can uh, give certain food like very mild thing in small quantities where if vomiting is not there uh, professor hello yes hello. yeah uh, normally we use wasao guideline uh, that mm -hmm. we uh, we give vac power vaccines six, six weeks yeah mm -hmm. then uh, from eight weeks we will give DH, DHP, DHL and power vaccine. Mm -hmm. Demand that means 12 weeks, uh, rabies and DHP. Wait, which week? Rabies At and DHP At 12 weeks or 3 months. 12 weeks, yeah. Oh, yeah. 3 months. Uh, after another 4 weeks, that means 16 weeks, we give rabies and DHP. Uh, is, yes. is it correct? Uh, you know, according to guidelines, there are no, uh, no, you know, it's okay to give that. Uh, we can't give rabies vaccine. It's not recommended to give rabies vaccine until 12 weeks of age. Most of the vaccines available um, in the world, they are recommended to give puppies older than three, uh, 12 weeks of age. And leptospirosis also should be given to 12 weeks of uh, pup, dogs older than 12 weeks of age. So you are just following that. And uh, you are giving uh, uh, power, you start power at six weeks, and in eight weeks, you give DHPL, right? DHP. D DHPL, Professor. DHPL. Yeah, it's better to avoid L uh, until uh, 12 weeks of age. The problem is most of the, our diluent contain L, and even Vasawa has said, uh, you know, they have uh, looked into that matter. They have recommended to keep the, the liquid portion and, uh, you know, dilute the freeze-dried component in, a, in, in the board of injection and then give that and give the leptospira part at 12 weeks of age. So no need to give leptospira when the dogs are, uh, you know, younger than 12 weeks of age. But we have to give two doses of leptospira vaccine 
because it's a kill vaccine. Even rabies, you have to give two doses, right? According to the regulations in our country, uh, after you know 12 weeks of age. So uh, yeah, it's okay. It's uh, it's a good uh, vaccination protocol. The only only my only concern is, if possible, try to give the DHL and HAO on two different days. Giving multiple vaccines on the same day will, you know, the, it will overburden the lymphocytes, usually lymph, uh, lymph nodes. Usually the vaccine are taken into the closest lymph node and processed within that. You know, the dendritic cells are there. They just uh, process the vaccine antigen. When our vaccine contains so many multiple components, it's too much work for that particular um, lymph node. So we are not supposed to divide it into several doses and give several, you know, uh, doses and give it to different sites. Uh, the, the possible thing is that's why multivalent vaccines are usually better than monovalent vaccines are usually better than multivalent vaccines. When there are multiple components in the vaccine, sometimes it could affect the immunogenicity. But it's okay. The usual, if you can just give the uh, eight week, if you can just give DHL only, it, it's, I think, more appropriate. But it's okay. Your schedule is all right. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, Professor Anurudhika, there's another question. Uh, do we need to vaccinate the recovered power puppies? If so, when? No, no. If you, the thing is, if you can confirm that particular puppy is affected by a power virus, there's no need of vaccination at all because it will produce lifelong immunity. No need to vaccinate, never again, right? But the thing is, uh, you know, that there may be some other disease condition which uh, are seen you know, clostridium perfringens and sometimes even the hemorrhagic uh, E. coli, which will uh, induce similar symptoms. So if you can confirm the puppy is affected by uh, POW, you know, by doing PCR or patient site uh, test kit, then no need to vaccinate. Throughout the life, you can, you don't need to vaccinate. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another one. Could you please give, uh, sorry. Uh, could you please give an explanation about the success rate of the treatments of vaccinated dogs? Uh, you know, the, the other than the, the, I forgot to mention that there are certain other risk factors as well. This power virus is called as uh, black and brown dog disease, right? Particularly if uh, Rottweilers, Doberman pinches, or German Shepherd, when they are affected by power virus, uh, there are chances for them to develop severe disease. Whereas in mongrel dogs or other, sometimes the Labrador and other breeds, even from an alien, they have less, uh, ch less chance to develop severe infection. So recovery rate of those puppies are high, um, but uh, there's a mortality rate around uh, 19 to 20% just because of this uh, black and brown dogs. Particularly Rottweiler, if we do not address the hypovolemic shock and uh, if you do not take necessary action to correct the leu severe leukopenia, then they will die. So mortality rate, according to our um, research and our understanding, it is around 19, or just 20%. Okay, there's another question. Is it possible to get mild power infection in vaccinated dogs? Yeah, it is possible, yes, because uh, maybe the antibody teeters are there. It is not enough to protect the animal from the disease, but that level is enough to reduce the severity of the infection. So they will develop just mucoid diarrhea. It's possible. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's another uh, question in the chat box. Is coronavirus diarrhea exist in uh, Sri Lanka? Uh, I can read, read that. Yeah, oh. it may be the, because the thing is yeah. no one has tested it. Uh, in Thailand, uh, they have done a research and they have identified uh, coronavirus as well. But it is not very severe, the corona, enteric coronavirus, not the respiratory one. Enteric coronavirus affecting dogs uh, is causing very mild uh, lesion. Most of the time they have uh, isolated, uh, they have detected the coronavirus together with the power virus. So you do not know whether the severity of the disease is due to 
how virus itself or due to combination of uh, corona or how but this coronavirus won't cause any significant clinical signs it's a mild infection in dog enteric coronavirus yeah in the same question uh, she is asking how to differentiate uh, coronavirus diarrhea from pow uh yeah as i said the pow virus they definitely develop that uh, you know um, if the animal is not vaccinated they develop severe clinical signs but if it's vaccinated and as we discuss if it's just developing mucoid or just watery diarrhea just by looking at we can't differentiate it from uh, differentiate it from corona or pow yes even giardia and e coli salmonella they all cause uh, similar diarrhea so we do not know it's necessary to uh, you know do pcr or do some other test to confirm but corona virus may be just there in the gut as well okay thank you uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience you can ask to Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Kamja, I have a question from uh, Professor. Yeah, that is, yeah. Uh, generally, uh, you uh, mentioned that uh, no need to go for uh, annual vaccination uh, of uh, power viral for the dog, but if that vaccinated dog can uh, develop the mild disease, that means that dog can act as a host. Is there any... Uh, What do you call recommendation? They can transmit the virus, right? That. Yeah, that's uh, that yeah. possibility is there. Yes, but particularly this mild uh, diarrhea is developing uh, primary after primary vaccination, right? If you do the uh, if you do the uh, first year vaccination, you have to do the first year vaccination, and after that, the immunity is lifelong because uh, you know the the we only discuss about the. the humoral component the antibody mediated response but the the virus can induce cell mediated immune response as well so after one year um, there's a little chance to develop mild diarrhea and yeah as you said there's a uh, you know possibility of transmitting the disease uh, from those vaccinated dogs to others uh, from there's a chance yeah but it's rare right thanks uh prasa and rudrika there is another question does the efficiency of vaccination is higher with the monovalent vaccine as second vaccination compared to multivalent vaccine like bhp yes that yeah i think i explained that when we give multivalent vaccine the you know we you do it because it's cost effective and it's even easier for the client and when we give multivalent vaccine is too much work to the adjacent lymph node as i said it's just taken up by the, the closest lymph node then there are three or four vaccine uh, viral strains at the same time so the the immune system needs to develop antibodies to uh, all or stimulate the cells to uh, produce both cell mediated and humoral cell response to both the uh, vaccine so it's ideal if you can give monovalent vaccines yeah uh next question is how long it will take to neutralize the maternal antibody by the given vaccine it's actually uh, immediately you know the the maternal antibodies are present in the uh, not immediately after 3 days because maternal antibodies are present in the serum and then the and vaccine antigen is taken up to the closest lymph node uh, dendritic cell process it presented it and then uh, it then the maternal antibodies come and neutralize it maybe one two days no yeah no need to go to the circulation it will come to the lymph node and neutralize so it's uh, um, just after uh, maybe couple of hours so just one day after vaccination uh, antibodies will be neutralized i'm not sure whether asking about the the waning or declining of the antibody it will take like some most of the time um, by the time of 8, 8 weeks uh, it is lower than protective level but in certain dogs um, it has been reported that the maternal derived antibodies could last up to 20 weeks particularly if the the puppy is born to a mother who has been infected with the virus right if they have very high antibody titers and it will take like maybe even 16 20 weeks to uh, uh, decline 
Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, if uh, there are no any other questions, uh, let me deliver the vote of thanks as the Secretary Veterinary Association. So, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I would like to thank and I highly appreciate Dr. Anuruddhika Disanayaka for accepting our invitation today and uh, presenting the, today's webinar. Uh, Professor Anuruddhika, it's very informative actually. We have learned a lot of new knowledge. Uh, I, I personally, uh, for me also, we, I have learned a lot because I have learned power viral infection about 20 years ago. Uh, but from today, I learned a lot of new knowledge. So, thank, let me thank you on behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association again to Professor. And thank you for spending your valuable, valuable time with us, uh, Professor Anruddhika. Uh, and next, uh, I would like to thank uh, our president, uh, Dr. Susanta Malavarachi and uh, Dr. Uh, Sugat uh, Pemachanda for uh, being, with here, being here with us and also organizing uh, today's webinar. And also, I would like to thank all the participants who joined uh, from Sri Lanka as well as from all other countries especially from India. Uh, special thanks goes to the Indian Veterinary Association. So thank you very much for joining uh, with us today. I hope uh, you all have received a, a very good knowledge about uh, power viral uh, infection. Uh, next, uh, I must uh, invite all, all of you for the next webinar, uh, which will be on uh, next Sunday and at one o'clock uh, Sri Lanka time. And also you all can uh, watch the, this uh, same presentation by uh, joining our YouTube channel uh, and also uh, by, uh, by uh, joining our Facebook page. Uh, so thank you very much again and uh, hope to see you all at the, our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chamari, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Secretary SLVA and uh, Dr. Uh, Malwarachi President, as well as Dr. Sukar for inviting me and all the participants for uh, active participation. Thank you.